Section number 27 of Happy Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeremy Robertson. Happy Days by A. A. Milne. Chapter 27 An Inland Voyage. Thomas took a day off last Monday in order to play golf with me. For that day, the Admiralty had to get along without Thomas. I tremble to think what would have happened if war had broken out on Monday. Could a Thomasless Admiralty have coped with it? I trow not. Even as it was, battleships grounded, crews mutinied, and several awkward questions in the House of Commons had to be postponed until Tuesday. Something, some premonition of this, no doubt, seemed to be weighing on him all day. Rotten weather, he growled, as he came up the steps of the club. I'm very sorry, I said. I keep on complaining to the secretary about it. He does his best. What's that? He taps the barometer every morning and says it will clear up in the afternoon. Shall we go out now, or shall we give it a chance to stop? Thomas looked at the rain and decided to let it stop. I made him as comfortable as I could. I gave him a drink, a cigarette, and mistakes with the mashie. On the table at his elbow I had in reserve faulty play with the brassy and a West Middlesex directory. For myself I wandered about restlessly, pausing now and again to read enviously a notice which said that C.D. Topping's handicap was reduced from twenty-four to twenty-two. Lucky man. At about half-past eleven the rain stopped for a moment and we hurried out. The course is a little wet, I said apologetically as we stood on the first tee, but with your naval experience you won't mind that. By the way, I ought to warn you that this isn't all casual water. Some of it is river. How do you know which is which? You'll soon find out. The river is much deeper. Go on, your drive. Thomas won the first hole very easily. We both took four to the green, Thomas in addition having five splashes of mud on his face, while I only had three. Unfortunately, the immediate neighborhood of the hole was under water. Thomas, the bounder, had, sm had a small heavy ball which he managed to sink in nine. My own, being lighter, refused to go into the tin at all, and floated above the hole in the most exasperating way. I expect there's a rule about it, I said, if only we knew, which gives me the match. However, until we find that out, I suppose you must call yourself one up. I shall want some dry socks for lunch, he muttered as he splashed off to the tea. Anything you want for lunch you can have, my dear Thomas. I promise you that you shall not be stinted. The next green is below sea level altogether, I'm afraid. The first in the water wins. Honors, it turns out, were divided. I lost the hole and Thomas lost his ball. The third tee having disappeared, we moved on to the fourth. There's rather a nasty place along here, I said. The secretary was sucked in the other day and only rescued by the hare. Thomas drove a good one. I topped mine badly and it settled down in the mud fifty yards off. Excuse me, I shouted as I ran quickly after it, and I got my nibbling onto it just as it was disappearing. It was a very close thing. Well, said Thomas as he reached his ball, that's not what I call a brassy lie. It's what we call a corkscrew lie down here, I explained. If you haven't got a corkscrew, you'd better dig around it with something, and then when the position is thoroughly undermined, oh, good shot. Thomas had got out of the fairway in one, but he still seemed unhappy. My eye, he said, bending down in agony, I've got about half Middlesex in it. He walked around in circles, saying strange nautical things, and my suggestions that he should, one, rub the other eye, and two, blow his nose suddenly, were received ungenerously. Anything you'd like me to do with my ears, he asked bitterly. If you'd come and take some mud out for me instead of talking rot, I approached with my handkerchief and examined the eye carefully. See anything? asked Thomas. My dear Thomas, it's full of turf. We mustn't forget to replace this if we can get it out what the secretary would say. There, how's that? Worse than ever. Try not to think about it. Keep the other eye on the ball as much as possible. This is my hole, by the way. Your ball is lost. How do you know? I saw it losing itself. It went into the bad place I told you about. It's gone to join the secretary. Oh, no, we got him out, of course. I keep forgetting. Anyhow, it's my hole. I think I shall turn my trousers up again, said Thomas, bending down to do so. Is there a local rule about it? No, it is left entirely to the discretion and good taste of the members. Naturally, a little extra license is allowed on a very muddy day. Of course, if... Oh, I see. You meant a local rule about losing your ball in the mud? No, I don't know of one, unless it comes under the heading of casual land. Be a sportsman, Thomas, and don't begrudge me the whole. The game proceeded, and we reached the twelfth tee without any further contretemps, save that I accidentally lost the sixth, ninth, and tenth holes, and that Thomas lost his iron at the eighth. He had carelessly laid it down for a moment while he got out of a hole with his niblick, and when he turned around for it, the thing was gone. At the twelfth tee, it was raining harder than ever. We pounded along with our coat collars up and reached the green absolutely wet through. How about it, said Thomas? My hole, I think, and that makes us all square. I mean, how about the rain, and it's just one o'clock? Just as you like. Well, I suppose it is rather wet. All right, let's have lunch. 
We had lunch. Thomas had it in, in the only dry things he had brought with him, an ulster and a pair of varden cuffs, and sat as near the fire as possible. It was still raining in torrents after lunch, and Thomas, who is not what I call keen about golf, preferred to remain before the fire. Perhaps he was right. I raked up an old copy of Stumers with the Niblick for him, and read bits of the telephone directory out aloud. After tea, his proper clothes were dry enough in places to put on, and as it was still raining hard and he seemed disinclined to come out again, I ordered a cab for us both. It's really rotten luck, said Thomas, as we prepared to leave, that on the one day when I take a holiday, it should be so beastly. Beastly, Thomas, I said in amazement. The one day? I'm afraid you don't play inland golf much. I hardly ever play around London. I thought not. Then let me tell you that today was the best day's golf I've had for three weeks. Golly, said Thomas. End of an Inland Voyage Recording by Jeremy Robertson